Well, and a good Saturday morning to you here, Russ Barkley, back from a wonderful 12 days doing a Bavarian beer experience, visiting breweries, uh, also farmers growing hops and barley and looking at the malting process over in Germany. So my partner and I had a terrific trip with 10 other people going with the master brewer of one of our best local breweries here in Richmond, the Hardywood Brewery. If you're ever in Richmond, you might want to check them out. They make a really good product. In any case, I'm five pounds heavier, uh, obviously need to join AA, but we had a terrific time. So uh, up this week, we're going to be talking about three articles that appeared. And before that, I get into that, however, here's your dad joke, and I'm going to tell you where I'm getting this one from so that you don't blame me for this. All right, this comes from the website for fatherly.com, and obviously you can read this for yourself. What do you call a fake noodle? An impasta. <laughs> you got to like that one. Come on, guys. Now, don't blame me. That's a joke from fatherly.com. So, okay. First up in our research review is an article that comes to us from Argentina. This is a study that looked at the risk of Lewy body disease and cognitive impairment in adults with ADHD who had been followed for 15 years. By the way, Lewy body disease is often thought of as a precursor to dementia. And as you know, mild cognitive impairment is often thought of as kind of a prodromal or early phase to what may go on to become dementia in older individuals. So this study looked at a group with ADHD and a group without ADHD in adults. There were, the adults, by the way, were between 45 and 70 years old and had been followed for about 15 years. And what did the authors find in this particular study? By the way, this was published over in the American Journal of Geriatric Psychiatry. And what they found is, yes, they confirmed an increased risk of either dementia or Lewy body disease in adults with ADHD who from midlife onward, when followed for 15 years, did have a significant increase in the risk for Lewy body disease and dementia. The risk was about, uh, as I recall here, one in six of the adults with ADHD went on to develop one of these conditions, either a precursor to dementia or dementia itself, uh, as compared to the group that did not have ADHD. As you know, we've talked about this before. There is some evidence out there that there might be an elevated risk of Parkinson's or of Alzheimer's or of other dementias in ADHD, but it's been difficult for us to tell because the studies were not particularly well done and they usually were correlational. And again, I want to emphasize that this also is a correlational study, although the fact that it's longitudinal in nature does help us see that these people did not have any sign of Lewy body disease or dementia when they first entered the study, but over that 15 year period, they did have an elevated increase. So uh, this is an important study, but let's keep in mind it has a couple of limitations. Uh, one of those is that these were adults that were referred to a neurology department. That's important because it suggests that these individuals may have had more severe disorders like ADHD or other neurological problems or thought they already were experiencing mild cognitive impairment and wondered whether or not they were coming down with dementia. So it's not a cross-section of the adult ADHD population. It suggests to me that this represents a more severe group of individuals, and therefore it's not surprising that they might have a higher risk of dementia and Lewy body disease given that severity. So the risks found here should not be extrapolated to all adults with ADHD from midlife onward. And as it says here, 
the risk ratios for dementia and for Lewy body disease were about three times higher for dementia uh, and uh, significantly elevated about 50 times higher for Lewy body disease. So this study shows that adult ADHD is independently associated with a risk for these disorders. Okay, so let's not get too excited, however. Uh, as I said, this is a severe group. We don't know what their treatment history is specifically. We don't know if they were at higher risk for a variety of factors that had nothing to do with their ADHD. So pay attention to correlational study doesn't prove causation. Okay, next up is a large study out of China. This is a study that was published over in the British Medical Journal in their Pediatrics Open Access Journal, and it is a study of a very large sample of 177,000 plus children, and it's looking at the risk of autism spectrum disorder and of ADHD in children with cerebral palsy, as you can see here on my screen. So let's scroll down and have a look at what they found. Overall, they found that about three-tenths of 1% of this very large sample of children had cerebral palsy. They found that about 1% qualified on the autism spectrum disorder, and about nearly 8% had ADHD. Those statistics are in keeping with what we see in other countries, including here in the U.S., by the way. So they then went on and took the children with cerebral palsy and looked at how likely were they to also have autism spectrum disorder. They were about five times more likely to have ASD, suggesting that if a child starts out with cerebral palsy, they have a very good probability of also having ASD. But again, just because it's six times more common, the rate of autism was still only 6% in the children with ASD. Now let's look at the ADHD group because we're more interested in that. The kids with cerebral palsy were twice as likely to have ADHD than was the case in the general population without cerebral palsy. Again, comparison, about 16% of the kids with cerebral palsy had ADHD versus about 8% that uh, had ADHD in the general population. So about double the risk of ADHD. What this study shows is that if children are born with cerebral palsy, they carry an elevated risk for both of these neurodevelopmental disorders uh, and the risk is greater for autism than it is for ADHD, but both disorders are at higher risk. Even given that, the vast majority of children with cerebral palsy did not have either disorder, although they were more likely than typical children to do so. So very interesting study there. Finally, last up is a very interesting study, in my opinion, out of New Zealand. This is a randomized trial. It's a pilot study, but it's the first randomized trial I've seen of chiropractic adjustment for children with ADHD. I've known for many years here in the U.S. that chiropractors, not all of them, but some of them offer a special kind of treatment for children with ADHD. It used to be called neurologic organization training. It's a form of skull or scalp massage believed to result in a release of trapped nerve cells in the brain so that they can then go on and function normally. So the theory behind chiropractor treatment of ADHD is pretty lame in my opinion. Uh, it's certainly extremely hypothetical. Uh, and uh, I, I think we have to take it with a grain of salt. But what's interesting here is that this group of researchers in New Zealand went on and did a study where they randomized children with ADHD to receive either chiropractic treatment with the usual and customary treatment, often including medication. And then they had children who were given sham chiropractic manipulation and also treatment as usual. Overall, the children improved. That's because all of them got some kind of usual and customary treatment. There were no differences 
between the two groups. That's very important because it suggests that when you include a placebo, a sham kind of treatment, in this case, chiropractic treatment, uh, what you find is that there is no significant evidence that the chiropractic treatment helps, which of course we would have guessed anyway, but it's important that people understand that although this treatment is being offered out there, even here in the US, to families if they seek chiropractic treatment, for ADHD, that this treatment so far has little, if any, evidence for its effectiveness in helping kids with ADHD. So there you have it. As always, the links to these three articles can be found in the description that goes with this video. And I list all the other research that was published during this week in that description as well, in case you're interested in it. The reason I don't review it is that oftentimes it's either uh, not very good research or it replicates what we already know. There's nothing interesting about it uh, or it's a dissertation. Okay, well, that was Moosey. He's calling me to go give him some food. So I'm gonna sign off here. Thanks for joining me this weekend. And I hope you guys have a great week and I'll see you next week with another research review. Russ Barkley, signing off here. Thank you.